Become, getting rich is not an act, it is a habit. So it is staying poor, it's also not an act, it's not something that just happens to you, it is a habit. Most people, they, they, they listen to a webinar, they watch a video, and they say, oh, this guy's making whatever, how much money online. I could do that, and they jump into it, and then they try for three months, and say, oh, this thing doesn't work. Why do you think people watch reality TV? You know what, I thought my life is a mess, but look at these people on TV. Instantly, you feel better about yourself. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. What's up, Believe Nation? It's Evan. My one word is believe, and I believe in you. I believe you have Michael Jordan level talent at something, and I want you to find it, embrace it, and use it to make a difference. So let's get your motivation to a 10 and get you believing in you. Grab a snack and chew on today's lessons from a man who went from immigrating to Canada at age 14 with zero money and not speaking any English to failing 13 separate businesses to now becoming one of the highest paid consultants in the real estate game. He's Dan Locke, and here's my take on his top 10 rules for success. Enjoy. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one, learn more. When the first business partner that I had, it was like a, uh, basically, he was my neighbor. And at the time, I was trying to build my little business and he sold me on the concept, oh, you need a website. And I pay him some money. Uh, long story short, he basically scammed me out of like $150,000. Oh, wow. uh, I lost all my mom's money, all the savings. Um, and I didn't know anything about internet marketing. And then right after that, because that experience was so traumatic for me, from then on, everything I do, I said, I want to learn it 100%. Mm. So I went, and at, at the time, internet marketing, I bought the Corey Rudo course. I don't yeah. know if you remember yeah, yeah, the yeah. Yeah. Inside the Secrets to Marketing the Internet. Right. That the two big binders, like 600 pages, I went through it in two days. Wow. And from then on, I was just like reading every, like forget about like reading a book a month. I was yeah. reading a book every two, three days. Wow. So that experience changed how I operate. Mm. And that, that's how I developed this hunger to learn yeah. as much as I could. Yeah. So I would feel, I don't think it's a healthy thing. It's when I went to Tony's event, Unleash the Power Within. Yeah. I don't know if that's a healthy thing, but I always have this feeling of, no, I need to know more. Right. I need to know more. Right. Rule number two, my personal favorite, add value. I was knocking on door mm -hmm. and no one, like I was knocking, hey, do you want me to move your Oh, no, no, we don't need that. We don't need that. Yeah. <laughs> At the time, I, I had my mom had a friend, my aunt. Mm -hmm. uh, she had a, a printing business, mm -hmm. right? Uh, like you know, printing business card and right. flyers and all that. So I went to my aunt and said, "Hey, aunt, why don't you know you print a bunch of flyers? I will help you distribute in the in the neighborhood, like printing service." But yeah, there are two sides of flyer, right? <laughs> right. I said, right, "You yeah. print five thousand of these. Yeah. I'll run around. I'll I'll distribute it. On the other side, can I put my stuff on it?" Right? Yeah, my lawn mowing right, services. Right? Yeah, it's just like, oh, what the heck, right? Yeah. And so I've been always very entrepreneurial. Yeah, you know how to you know be resourceful in the situation, be, we win, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because because a lot of people wouldn't have even tried that because they'll no. say, "Well, I don't have the money for a lawn mower. I don't have any of that." So it's that a good, stopped them, right? Yeah, it's a good uh, proof right there that it's not about what you have, it's about what you do with what you have. 100%. And you were exuding that even at a young age. It's never lack of resources, I think it's a lack of resourcefulness, right? Mm. And, and I was just resourceful, I had no money. Mm. So I had time, mm. I can put in effort, and I, I distributed all 500 flyers, I ran home, and I was just waiting for the phone, I thought I'm gonna get rich. Yeah. <laughs> I thought, oh my God, 5,000 5, people? Oh my God, I'm gonna get 100 phone call. Oh, I'm gonna block my time, I'm still going to school. I thought I'm gonna make like thousands of dollars, right? Right. One hour, no call. Mm -hmm. One day, no call. Three days, not a single one. <laughs> I was checking the flash. Did I put in the wrong number? Right. No, it was the right number, right? Not a single phone call from the flyer, <laughs> wow. right? And and I learned, okay. There's something that you know you can have a great product, a great service, but if you don't know how to get it out there, do marketing and, and get people to pay attention, mm -hmm. no one's gonna buy from you. So I came with an idea, I thought to myself, and this affected my philosophy for the rest of my life, my mm -hmm. business philosophy. So I thought, think back, the very first client I had mm -hmm. who paid me 20 bucks, what did I do? I mowed the lawn first before asking anything in return. Mm -hmm. That's how I got that first $20, right? Right, yeah. I thought, let me do that again. So I ran around the neighborhood and I found one of the most, probably one of the higher and expensive homes in the mm -hmm. neighborhood. 
and I, I saw the lawn was like up to this high, mm. like high. And I just found a, found a day and I just mowed the entire thing. Now this is illegal. Yeah. You're not supposed to do that. I'm not an advocate of that, but I did that. So I, you didn't even knock on their door? You no, just I just mowed the whole lawn, <laughs> right? I did the whole thing. Right. And I finished the whole thing and I sat at the front door waiting for the home homeowner to come back. <laughs> okay, she, it's funny, it's a housewife. She yeah. came back and she couldn't, she couldn't recognize her lawn. Cause is this not right, right? Yeah. She drove by and then she drove back and she pulled, what the hell is going on, right? right. And she's like, who are you? I, I said, you know, I said, I'm just a kid. I'm trying to make, you know, make some money. I provide the services, a fly. Oh, this is awesome. You know, my husband travels all the time. Mm -hmm. He never is never home. I can't do this stuff. Thank you so much. You make my lawn look so nice. She gave me a hundred dollars. Wow. A hundred dollars, yeah. right? And that affected me for the rest of my life. So my business philosophy until this very day, if you say one of my motto for, for business, mm -hmm. add value first before you ask anything in return. Mm -hmm. That's how I always approach. You know how most business people, they approach somebody, yeah, they want to sell them some shit, right? right? Or they, they want to, hey man, you do something for me, mm -hmm. or like, you know, on social media, people come to me all the time. Or they feel like just because I'm successful, that I'm obligated to help them. Right, you can so easily or so easily will just give them. That's handouts. not the case, you got, they gotta earn it. So my philosophy is any interaction with people, mm -hmm. how can I add value to what you do? It's always my f most favorite question is this, what is the most important project you're working on that can add value to? Rule number three, improve yourself. Many years ago when I first met my mentor uh, and I was telling him about all these businesses that I had started, I said, hey, you know, Alan, I mean, I started all these businesses and, and somehow, I don't know, man, I'm not, I'm not making enough money, I'm struggling. I don't know why uh, my, you know, my, my customers, they're like cheap, uh, they're very difficult to deal with. And, oh man, I don't know, the economy, uh, it kind of sucks. And I think I pay too much in taxes. I mean, I was rambling on and complaining and bitching about all these things. And he said, stop. I said, what? He said, stop. I said, what do you mean? He said, stop. He said, it's very simple, Dan. Let me teach you something. He said, if your business sucks, it's because as a business person, you suck. I said, what? No, I, said, no, I work hard. I said, I was very defensive. I was like, I, I learned and I try to, try to do my best and, and try to serve my customers. He said, no, you suck as a business person. He said, if, if you got sales problem, it means you suck as a salesperson. If you got employee problem, it means it sucks that you're, you are a manager and a business leader. It's very, very simple. He said, remember this, your business is always a reflection of you. Your business is always a reflection of you. Nothing more. So, if you think about it, why most businesses fail? I think why most businesses fail is because the reason, the intent, most people, they start the businesses for the wrong reason. They start the business because they want to get out of a job. Uh, they start a business because they want, to, uh, they want to make money, of course. Nothing wrong with that. They start a business because they think maybe there's an opportunity. It sounds like it's easy with a big money, it's not. They started for the wrong reason versus they see a need in the marketplace, there's a skill, there's, a, there's expertise, there's some value they could bring to that particular industry, right? There's something that you could bring. So think about it, it's like if, think of starting a business like flying a, a plane, and you can't just say, well, I'm passionate, I have a great idea, let me fly that plane. Well, have you, have you fly a plane before? No. Do you know how to fly a plane? No. Do you know where you're going? No. But it looks like fun. Let me get on a plane. What are the chances of you crashing? Very high. And that's why statistics shows. 90% of small businesses fail in the first five years. Even the ones who survive after five years, most of them don't, don't pass the million dollar mark. They're just kind of surviving. And that's why people go into business for the wrong reason. And they go into business without the proper training without the skills.
I could tell you when I had all those failures, when I started all these crazy businesses, and why I, if they failed, it's not because the vehicle, it's because of me as a business person that I, I didn't have the business acumen, I didn't have the business experience, I didn't know anything about leadership, marketing, sales, negotiation, raising capital, any of these skills I have today. So everything I, I did, it didn't work because I was a lousy business person. I sucked as a business person, but I learned from my mistakes. And that's the good thing about business. You could suck many, many, many years. When you get better, you learn from it, you, get, you suck less. And when you practice and you dust yourself out, you learn from mistakes, you suck even a little less. Until one day you wake up, you say, you know what, I don't suck no more. And one win in business can make up for a lot of losses. One win can make up for all your losses. Rule number four, set wealth triggers. So you notice I have a lot of wealth triggers in my office. Mm -hmm. So it's not just decorative item, everything means something to me. Right. So I have like, you know, the LOK that starts, that represents personal branding. Yeah. So I can think about that, like leadership, energy, and For sure. wisdom. So everything's that in my office, I wanted to, I call them wealth triggers. Yeah. It should, it should, create certain type of feeling environment for me, right? Mm. I always believe your environment is more powerful yeah. than your, your willpower. Right. So I want it sure. to be performed. So I have meetings here That's all awesome. the time. People That's come awesome. over um, every week almost. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then I have the Chinese uh, kind of uh, right. saying there. Uh, yeah. I'll see if I can translate that. It <laughs> basically it means a kind of like the outer world a battles won before it's ever fought. Right. And and your decisions affect um, affect the the outcome of the battle. Mm. Uh, even you're like a thousand miles away. Right. That's roughly how it. That's goes. cool. I That's like cool. strategize. Yeah. Strategy, yeah. Right? No, I love that. Rule number five: find mentors. I tried most things like most people. I, I read the success books and mm. going to Think and grow rich and thinking grow rich and how to win friends, influence people. <laughs> right, yeah. right. You know, back and forth many times. Like all these books and you know I would get up in the morning and I would look in the mirror and say I'm successful and yeah. it's gonna be a great day affirmation yeah, right. and and I would I would visualize I would I did all this <laughs> meditate, love and, meditate yes. and, and put me in a vision board I did all <laughs> I did all that stuff right yeah so you know yes 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 you know all right. this stuff right so it was okay I think all those things they they help mm -hmm. but really the, the turning point was when I found my first mentor mm -hmm. his name is Alan Alan. Alan. And at the time, Alan was, he ran one of the, the he was the founder mm -hmm. of a Ring Real Estate Investment Network in Canada, mm -hmm. which was at the time one of the largest real estate investment network uh, in Canada. Mm -hmm. And How did you find him? Uh, good question. Because I, I want to ask you that because there might be somebody listening to this or watching this that might be on their 12th or 13th failure yeah. right at that turning point. So to somebody sitting there and kind of confused, how would, how did you find your mentor and what would be your recommendation? I'll, I'll tell you how I found my mentor and I'll give, then I'll give them the advice of, right. of where to find. So at a time I was just like an opportunity junkie. Right. I had no money, so I would attend these like free seminars and I would get on these like mailing lists, right? right. And Alan was running one of the largest financial seminar companies in Canada. Mm -hmm. He was the first one that brought Robert Kiyosaki. Mm, from Rich Dad Poor Dad, yeah, Robert first guy, Kiyosaki. Before even Kiyosaki was famous. Mm -hmm. He was the first guy. So I was getting all these junk mails, direct mail, like not, not Instagram, not Facebook, right. direct mail, right? Yeah. And I would always, always be fascinated by the way that he would write these sales letters. Right. And I would collect them. Mm -hmm. I would collect them, put in, uh, three-o punch them, put them in a binder, and I would save them and I would study them. I was just fascinated by the way he communicates, right? So the copywriting the on copywriting. it. Copywriting. Yeah. And his, I remember the name Alan Jacks, right? Mm -hmm. That's his name. And at a t one time I was attending a free conference, mm -hmm. I was sitting, <laughs> sitting in the back, and I was watching the speaker. Mm -hmm. a, gen a gentleman sat down next to me and was watching the speaker, was looking at you. I was looking, I was like, I noticed a name tag. Yeah. It says Alan Jacks. Wow. And I thought, no, no f way. Yeah. No way. And I said, are you Alan Jacks? He said, yes. I said, are you the one that's hosting these events and writing these letters? And it's like, yes, he said, I am. I'm like, holy f right? <laughs> holy sh that's my yeah. internal dialogue. I try to be calm. Right. I said, holy f I said, I'm a huge 
fan. Yeah. Like I, I love what you do. And he thought mm -hmm. I was referring to the event. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, you know, we do pretty good events. I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> I study your letters. Yeah. I said, I collect them. I tell them I, I collect these letters. Mm -hmm. And he was shocked. Because mm -hmm. I don't think he's ever had anyone telling him that. Right. Like a young guy, 20, 20 someone, 21 years old, like mm -hmm. talking Fanning about marketing. out on the copyright. Yeah, yeah like yeah. The, collecting the junk mail. Mm -hmm. And I was just fascinated. I said, I said, I said Mr. Jack, I said, I said, can I buy you lunch? Mm -hmm. And I always remember the reply. He paused. He said, uh, what the hell, I got to eat. <laughs> Yeah. That was the start of a relationship. Wow. And we had lunch, we talked for hours. And then I, afterwards, I asked him to be my mentor, which he turned me down. Mm. And I was, again, not recommending this. Mm -hmm. I was basically stalking him in his right. office. Well, I went to his office every f day, every day. So you would physically go there? I would go to the office. I would, I would say anything. I would pick up the trash, anything. Yeah. I would just demonstrating. I want to help anything. Yeah. I don't care about money. I don't want a salary. I don't want anything. Mm -hmm. And at, and finally, a month later, they said, "Okay, I just need to hire you. Just so this is this is like <laughs> this is bothering me so much, <laughs> right? He's yeah. bothering my staff. Fine, like this young man is like crazy, right? Mm -hmm. And he did. And I worked for him for almost for a year, for next to nothing. Wow. And I was <laughs> funny story. So he, we were doing a lot of direct mail, right? Mm -hmm. So we would stuff these envelopes, and I would help stuff the envelopes. And you know the envelope, the stamps, and I would lick the, lick the envelope, right. and I would put the... After about two weeks of that, he said, Dan, you can actually use water for that. <laughs> I, was so, I was so dumb, I was getting poisoned yeah. by licking five, 500 envelopes yeah. like that and put the whole thing in. But that's how I got started. <laughs> right. That's like how naive I was. But I was just hungry. Rule number six, get good habits. We are what we repeatedly do. Human beings, we are creatures of habits. You notice that you kind of do the same thing, the same routine over, over, and again, and again, and again. See, become, getting rich is not an act. It is a habit. So it is staying poor. It's also not an act. It's not something that just happens to you. It is a habit. So let me teach you the three best habits of rich people. The very first habit of rich people, and that is, they count their money. Poor people don't count their money. They get a paycheck, they deposit the paycheck, they spend the money, they have no idea what the expenses are, they have no idea how the money flows. You notice, poor people, they a J-O-B, they have a job, and wait till maybe once a year when they file the, the ret tax return, his, the, the taxes that are owing is how much you have to pay. They look at the numbers, they even look at the numbers. They just, okay, all right. That's how much I need to pay for our tax return, and that's it. And look at it maybe, maybe once a year. Rich people, we don't do that. We look at our numbers regularly. We are financially literate. I'm not a numbers person, don't get me wrong, okay? I'm a concept guy, okay? I'm a big picture thinker. I'm a visionary. But I am very, very careful, and I'm very aware with how my money is flowing. Habit number two is they pay themselves first. Now you've heard of this before. Oh yeah, I know. Dan, I've heard of this, this before. You gotta pay yourself. Do you know actually what that means? Paying yourself doesn't mean buying yourself a car. It doesn't mean taking that vacation. It doesn't mean that you know you would, you know, you go blow money on entertainment. Oh yeah, I'm paying money myself. No, that's paying everybody else. When you're buying a car, you're paying the automotive motive company. When you're buying a house, you are paying the bank. When you are traveling, you are paying the, the traveling agency, you're paying the hotels, you're paying the, the, the flight company, the airplane company. Paying yourself meaning that you put your money aside and you invest your money. Now, I'm not talking about being frugal. You know, if you know anything about me, you know my work, I'm not talking about being frugal and being cheap. I'm talking about taking a percentage of your income and putting that aside, pay yourself first, and save it, and then you invest it. Habit of rich people number three, and that is rich people are constantly improving their earning ability. Because you might be thinking, Dan, okay, I want to pay myself first, but I'm not making enough money. I'm only making a few thousand a month. I, I, could ev I couldn't even afford to pay my bills. How am I going to pay myself first? First of all, you got to have the habit of paying yourself first. If you're not paying yourself 
first, even a tiny small percentage, when you're making 30, 40, 50, 60, $100,000 a year, I guarantee you when you're making a million, $2 million a year, you're not paying yourself. It is a habit that I'm talking about. And in order to do that, in order to be able to every single year to be able to pay yourself more and more and more and put into investments, you need to improve your earning ability. You need to find ways how you can add value to the marketplace, how to add more value to the marketplace. So every single year, your income is going up every year. If you've been, you've been working in, in, in the real world and you have your own business and your income kind of stays flat for the last two, three, five years, then shame on you. It means you're not learning. It means you're not thinking. It means you're not growing. Every single year, your income, you have to strive to improve that, your earning ability. And rich people, we're always constantly looking for ways to improve our earning ability, but also looking for ways to add leverage, to apply leverage into what we do. Rule number seven, don't have unrealistic expectations. And why do you think so many people fail in spite of the best efforts? You know, a lot of people watching this right now, they've maybe tried different ways of making money online or building businesses. Why do you think is the, the main reason why a lot of people fail? I think there are two main reasons. Uh, the first one is, I think, because of the whole internet uh, that they have, people have these unrealistic expectations. They see someone like you and say, oh, Stefan is doing this, he's got a YouTube channel and he's doing Kindle publishing and I want to do that. You know, I maybe mean, I'll make some videos too. What they don't see is how many years of effort that you put into it. Yeah. So most people, they, they, they listen to a webinar, they watch a video and they say, oh, this guy's making whatever, how much money online. I could do that and they jump into it and then they try for three months mm -hmm. and say, oh, this thing doesn't work. Yeah. Right? Or they jump into the next thing, right. Right. Bitcoin, whatever. Yeah, now it's yeah, Bitcoin yeah. so hard, right? <laughs> oh, and then, and then they try that and then try it for three months. Oh, that doesn't work. Yeah. They yeah. try the next thing. Yeah. Uh, so I think that expectations, the unrealistic expectation lead to, lead to disappointment and failure. Rule number eight, have a healthy mind and body. I saw a couple comments on YouTube, people asking, well, Dan, do you recommend these like mind stimulating or mind enhancing drugs? The answer is absolutely not. If you follow my work, you know I don't smoke, I don't drink, and I don't do drugs. I don't even drink coffee, right? I drink like honey green tea. That's what I drink, and water. And maybe from time to time, you know, Coke Zero when I'm watching a movie or something like that. That's it. No drugs, no cigarettes, and no alcohol. Why is that? Because you notice a lot of times, even with my own story, my father was actually a very heavy smoker. Uh, I won't say he's a, he was an alcoholic, but he drinks quite a bit. He enjoys a glass here and there. And I do notice later on when he had the stroke, he had all, when his health was in, it was declining, a lot of those habits contribute to that. If you don't have a healthy body, a healthy mind, there's no way in hell you'll be able to sustain the stress, the, the pressure it takes to be successful. So I don't think you need those things. You only need those mind enhancing drugs to be successful, to have more clarity and all this. Uh, if you want to enjoy a drink here and there, that's perfectly fine. I'm just saying I don't do it. I don't need to have alcohol to have a good time. And when I drink, I like people, hey, Dan, just a zip of beer, it's okay, enjoy. They don't taste good to me, quite frankly. I mean, they taste like, right? they don't even taste good to me. So I don't enjoy it, I don't need those things to have a good time. If I have a good time, good company, good friends, good conversation, I have a good time. And I don't need to get high to, to, to I get high on doing what I love. I get high on just life. I get high on being impacted people. Rule number nine, up your thermostat. Why great ideas alone are not enough? Why great ideas alone are not enough to change our lives? You see, one of the great mistakes that most people make is they're attempting to change their body. They're attempting to change the relationship. They're attempting to change their income, their finance. They're attempting to change something outside of themselves in searching something that's inside with themselves. Some people see themselves as conservative and, and safe, 
are they going to do anything crazy? Are they going to go bungee jumping or skydiving? No, uh, unless you're drunk or something like that. So you're not going to do anything crazy or act nuts unless you're drunk. Now, you might say it's the alcohol, but really it's just you finally getting permission to be yourself. The alcohol is just an excuse. If you are playful, if you're fun, if you're outrageous, you're going to talk differently, you're going to move differently, you're going to dress differently. <laughs> Maybe in a red suit. And you're going to do things differently. And there's no right or wrong, but most of us have trapped ourselves in an old self-image and never really update who we are today. So then when you go and learn a new skill, when you go learn a new ability, a new idea, but we're stuck in this self-image, this is who I am, and that's why we never surpass it. Let me give you a metaphor. This will make sense for you. Let's say in this room that we set the thermostat at 70 degrees. Let's say that 70 degrees is a metaphor. It's a what? Metaphor. metaphor for your comfort zone, which is also known as your self-image, your comfort zone. And most people have goals that are larger, they are more than their self-image. And that's why most people don't get to their goals unless they alter and or expand their self-image. So 70 degrees is your comfort zone. 70 degrees is your body. Not your goal, not where you want to be eventually, but what you're comfortable with. 70 degrees is your, the amount of love and passion and connection you have in your personal intimate relationship. Again, not your goal, but you know, what, where you live with, what you live with regularly. 70 degrees is the amount of money that you need to make to be comfortable. Not your goal, what you're comfortable with. Let's say the temperature drops to 65 degrees. Now what happens is your brain goes, hey, 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 I'm a 70 degree -er, not a 65. <laughs> the heater's kicked on, you feel there's a drive and there's this urge and you want to do something about it. By show of hand, how many of you have ever have experienced part of life, maybe your body, maybe your income, maybe your relationship, where it dropped and you felt it's not good enough and you felt this incredible drive to do something about it, yeah? Put that, put that way up and say, oh yeah. Oh yeah, and from there, and you try something and it doesn't work, and you try something else and it doesn't work, and you try something else and it doesn't work. Now, after a while, nobody wants to be a disappointment. No one, no one wants to feel like a failure in their lives. So what some people do is they lower the thermostats. They lower their expectations. They make their goals smaller, more realistic, more reasonable. Don't get your hopes up or you'll be disappointed. Well, you know, maybe, maybe not, I'm not a 70, 70 degree. -er. Maybe I'm a 65 degree. -er. Look at those 70 degree people. <laughs> so arrogant. <laughs> so full of themselves. They're probably workaholics anyway. I'm being smart, I'm cutting back, I'm downsizing. I don't want to burn myself out, I want to have more balance in my life. Now before you know it, they're at 62. Then they're at 58. Now by the way, when, you're at, when, they're, at, when they're at 58, do they hang around with 70 degree people? No! They hang around with 50 degree people. So they feel better about themselves on a regular basis. Why do you think people watch reality TV? You know what, I thought my life is a mess, but look at these people on TV. <laughs> Instantly you feel better about yourself. Now, but your attacks, obviously, you're not like that. You're an overachiever, yes? You're an overachiever. So when it's, when it's supposed to be at 70 degrees, you're at 65, what do you do? You do something about it, yes? You don't settle. You try it, you try something else, it doesn't work. You try something else, it doesn't work. You try something else, it doesn't work. You don't settle. You don't give up and you don't give in. If you hit a wall, you go around it, you go over it, you go under it, whatever it takes, you do it. And, and, and do you stop at 70 degrees? No, you keep going until you hit 80. 85, 90, 91, 92, 93, 
99 degree, and your brain goes, hey, 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 what do you think you're doing up here? <laughs> you're not a 90 degree -er. Who do you think you are? Get back to where you were. And suddenly you realize you're outside of your comfort zone. And then the heater stops, and you lose your drive. And you begin to self-sabotage yourself. And you stop doing what got you there in the first place, and you start doing some dumb things, <laughs> making some dumb decisions, until you get back to exactly where you think you deserve to be. Now, how many of you, I'm, no, I'm sure none of you have done this, but how many of you have seen other people sabotage themselves? <laughs> Yeah, I, I thought so, I thought so. You see, the strongest force in human personality is the need to remain consistent with how we see ourselves. The strongest force in human personality is the need to remain consistent with how we see ourselves. So the image that we hold of ourselves controls our successes and our failures and also impacts every single area of our life. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips, is have a sense of urgency. The average human lifespan is 75 years. One third of your life is spent sleeping. An other third of your life is spent on watching TV, movies, drinking and partying, traveling, spending time with family and friends, playing video games, commuting to work, buying groceries, paying the bills, being stuck in traffic, waiting in line, mowing the lawn, cleaning up the house, and doing laundry. 25 years left. In the first 18 years of your life, you are growing up. You are learning to walk, eat, run, and talk. You are totally dependent on your parents and going to school because you can't really think for yourself, call your own shots, or know how to be your own person. That means you have approximately seven years to make your dreams come true. And if you have a job, you probably spend most of that time working for someone else instead of building your own dream. Life is too short to waste time on people who don't lift you up or inspire you. Life is too short to be living somebody else's dream. Life is too short to wait. Life is too short not to take chances. Life is too short to wake up with regrets. Develop a sense of urgency in the pursuit of success and freedom. You must step up to live life on your own terms. Now I've got two very special Dan Lok bonus clips on how to decide to be successful and just keep trying that I think you're really gonna enjoy. But before that, I wanna make sure we're moving from consuming a video to now actually taking action in your life or your business. So I've got three questions for you to ask yourself. And in the answers, write them in your journal to yourself, discuss them with a friend, or leave them down in the comments below. Ready? Here we go. Question number one. What triggers can you put in your environment to steer you towards success? Question number two, what will you do to up your thermostat and raise your standards? And question number three, what is the most important habit that you need to improve right now? Thank you guys so much for watching. I believe in you. I hope you continue to believe in yourself and whatever your one word is, much love. I'll see you soon and enjoy the bonus clips. Well, I was born in Hong Kong, right? Mm -hmm. So I immigrated to Canada when I was 14 years old with no money, no connections, and couldn't speak a word of English. Mm -hmm. So you can see when, even when I s still today, I speak with an accent, mm -hmm. a little bit of an accent. So my mom and dad, uh, because they were having some, some issues, and so my mom decided that she didn't want to stay in the relationship. That's why we immigrated to, to Canada. At the time, I was so young, I was kind of like a punk kid. Yeah. I had no direction. Yeah. I was getting into fights and hanging <laughs> around with the wrong gang of people and you know, just always getting into trouble. Right. And so my mom, my mom and dad got divorced when I was 16 years old. Mm -hmm. 
And then shortly after that, my dad went bankrupt in Hong Kong. At the time, my mom and I, we were living in a one bedroom apartment. <laughs> okay, in one of the yeah. worst neighborhoods in Vancouver. Wow. So I remember I was, my mom would stay in the, uh, in the bedroom, I would sleep in the living room, right? With, uh, so on the floor, basically. I remember one day after school, I went home, door was locked and I knocked on my mom's door. She was on the phone with somebody. I didn't know who, mm -hmm. but I heard that she was crying on the phone. And I was like, hey, mom, mom, is everything okay? I was like, oh, no, no everything's okay, don't worry about it. And afterwards, uh, basically, I found out that she was on the phone with my dad. Mm. And my dad basically told my mom, he, he went bankrupt, he couldn't send us money anymore. Because at first he was sending us some allowance, yeah. right? And, I've, and my mom is a very, very positive, happy person. Like, mm. she's like one of those people that she's, friends with everybody like has no, right. no enemies right? right just a sweet 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 person so and i'll never forget the face of my mom like that face that facial expression mm -hmm. just so hopeless and she was like now what i'm gonna do i've been a housewife all my life how am i gonna raise this kid with with no money with a little bit of savings that and she, she wasn't working at that time no, no and you're no. 16 at this time as yeah, well 16 17 about mm -hmm. 17 and from then on, I said to myself, I don't care what the f I have to do. Mm. I don't want to see that face on my mom anymore. Yeah. That I don't care what it takes. I don't care what, how hard I have to work. That's, I think, the turning point. Mm. It planted a seed right. where I know that as a man, we want to provide for the family. Of course. And we want to, but I think as a man, we cannot protect the people that we love. Mm if we don't have the resources right it could be financial but if we don't have the resources mm -hmm. and that's when i made a decision i'm going to be successful mm -hmm. because unless i'm successful i cannot provide for the people that i love i cannot protect the people i love mm -hmm. and that was it from then on as the only child and that's when i started my first business the few ask me the question right oh dan what why what, what kept you going uh -huh. what's the motivation there's no motivation Every time I fell in a business venture, I was further and further in debt. Mm. So by the time I fell, I fell at 13 businesses wow. before having my first success. After you fail so many businesses, I was, so, I was in so much debt. If I were just to get a job, I would never pay that off. Right. It would take me, a, right. take me 20 years to pay that off. So it's more like I'm back to the corner. I have no way out. I got to make it work. Yeah. Yeah. So and I thought to myself, I just got to keep trying. Mm. And if I can just yeah. make it, and then yeah. it'll be fine. And that's exactly what it is. Wow. So, I mean, if you're in debt, that don't think about if you, oh, I want to save a few pennies, let's not drink the Starbucks coffee in the morning. Yeah. If that makes a difference, it's not going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. You need to focus on wealth creation. So you make more money, then you can wipe out the debt in a short period of time, right? Altruistic, world domination, honey empire, right? I'm grateful, I understand why I'm here. I think because I am so open. I wanted to think and see, it's a bloody brief life. All of you have the potential for enormous success. If you want to know what Gary Vee, DJ Khaled, Oprah, and others know about empire building that most people miss, check out the link in the description for a free bonus video.